The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Madeline Carroll in Make Way for the Lady. Before we tell you about our play, here's news about a new product of chemistry, DuPont Weed Killer. It completely destroys poison ivy and other harmful weeds. It's a boon to farmers and to the millions who this year are helping to grow the nation's food supply. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America presents Madeline Carroll in Make Way for the Lady, a play by Sidney Alexander based on the life of Mary Putnam Jacoby. Mary Putnam did not live to see a world in which women would stand shoulder to shoulder with men in fighting a war, but she envisioned such a day and did much to bring it to pass. Later in the program, Cavalcade will be privileged to present to its audience Major Margaret D. Craighill, first woman physician ever to be commissioned by the United States Army. Major Craighill is now on leave from the Women's Medical College. And now Cavalcade presents Madeline Carroll in Make Way for the Lady. We are at the turn of the century. In a brownstone house in Midtown, New York, an old woman is seated in her wheelchair by the window. These human ailments, doctor, why do they come when one is just beginning to learn how to live with one's fellow men? I have become so aware of time. There is so little of it left for me. Yes, I know the truth now. I have diagnosed my symptoms. I know the inevitable. I listen to the clock, and it seems that all my life I have raced ahead of time. But now time races ahead of me. Do you remember Godey's Ladies' Book, Doctor? That mid-Victorian world into which I was born? That world of puffed sleeves and lace and stuffed owls and unstuffed minds. Oh, I fluttered the dovecotes in my day. I caused some eyebrows to be raised. Eyebrows and, and voices. But you can't do it, lady. A woman, doctor. Don't make me laugh. Why doesn't she just stay home and have children? Votes for women? <laughs> Next thing you know, they'll be wanting to wear pants. Gallivanting over half the world, just like a man. Who does she think she is? Queen Victoria? A woman's place is in the home, if she's normal. Votes for women? Why, I don't want to vote. I love my husband. There must be something funny in a woman to make her do a thing like that. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, that's the way it was. Always being stared at as if I were a creature from another planet. I suppose I was, in a way. To live ahead of one's time is to live in another world. Another world. And so I got used to being looked at as somewhat odd. I remember the first time it happened, when that sentry greeted me as I came into the camp. Hey, miss, what are you doing here? I, I wish to see my brother, Sergeant Haven Putnam. This is no place for a lady. Don't you know the Confederate Army is just beyond that ridge? How'd you get here, anyway? I've got a pass from Colonel Holabird in New Orleans. Here, look. Uh? My brother's ill with malaria. I've come to nurse him. Where is he? Well, I'll be dogged. You sure got your nerve. Will you please take me to my brother, or do I have to call... Ah, now, don't get excited, miss. Follow me. In this tent. There he is, see? Oh, Sergeant Putnam. A lady to see you. Minnie. What are you doing here? We got your letter, Haven. I've come to nurse you. But how did you get here all the way from New York? Oh, Father arranged it. You, you came alone? Of course I came alone. Oh, good heavens. How did Father permit such a thing? Well, you might have been... Oh, lie still. And I wouldn't have been anything. I can take care of myself. Sure can, Sergeant. Never seen anything like it. Walked right into camp here as calm as if she was in her own parlor. Never mind that. Go tell the doctor I'm at his disposal and, and, and get me some cold compresses. Hurry. My 
brother recovered, and in a little while was his same old self again. But not me. I had changed. What I saw in that hospital, the suffering and pain and death changed me. I wanted to help, and I could do so little. If only I knew more. But women didn't know much in those days. I wasn't fashionable. And when you did know something, you tried to hide it. That was genteel, that was womanly. During my journey home, I made up my mind. You know the way you do it sometimes? You ask yourself questions, and then you try to give the answers. And suddenly you realize how silly it is, because your mind is made up. Only one thing did I insist on. I would do what I wanted, be what I wanted, and be a woman too. Now, Minnie, don't put words in my mouth. I didn't say that. What did you say, Father? I simply suggested you postpone it for a while. You know what this war's done to the publishing business. Besides, Minnie, you've already secured your degree in pharmacy. There isn't another young lady in the country who has done that. Should imagine your pride would rest content for a while. Pride? What's pride got to do with it? I want to help, Mother. Can't you help by being a pharmacist? I want to be a doctor. But why a doctor? Minnie, even a literary career would be less indelicate. Uh, perhaps with my publishing connections, Father, I Father, can... I want to be a doctor. A female doctor. Good heavens. Why, it's a contradiction in terms. It's like a square circle. Are the Blackwell sisters square circles? Would you call their work at the New York infirmary useless, indelicate? I don't know what you'd call them. They most certainly are not ladies. I don't want to be a lady either. Oh, I... oh. oh. Dear. What have I done now? Hurry, hurry, hand me the smelling salts. Oh. Now, now, Mother, there, there. Sniff this. Oh. There, my dear. That's better. Minnie, That's better. what a thing to say. I'm sorry, Mother. Let's put it this way. I want to be a doctor and a lady, but I simply refuse to spend my life as so many women do, clinging like a vine to some man. I want to help people, Father. Help, not hinder. I will not be useless. Poor dear father. He was an enlightened man for his day, but a female doctor. That was almost more than he could bear. When I came home with my degree from the Women's Medical College that spring of 1864, he still had forebodings. Well, now, Minnie, here it is, a shining copper plate for the front door. I hope the neighbors aren't scandalized. Oh, let's put it up now. Very well, though I doubt it'll do more than amuse the peddlers. Mary Putnam, M.D. Mary Putnam, M.D., well, well, well. I wonder if she examined you with your clothes on or... Uh, it's uh... indecent, that's what it is. And her father a Putnam. I wouldn't go to her with a sore toe. Sooner go to the barber. At least he's a man. Yes, at least he's a man. That's it. That's what they said. But I expected it. I had hope that maybe... But I expected it. And that shining copper shingle of mine gathered the wind and the rain, but no patience. Once in a long while, the doorbell would jangle and... Yes? I'd like to see the doctor, please. I'm the doctor. I beg your pardon, miss. I said I'd like to see the doctor, please. I heard you. I'm the doctor. Now, what's the trouble? You? Oh, I guess it ain't nothing, miss. Excuse me. And then one day it happened. I stood it as long as I could... But the prejudice was more than I could endure. So one day I decided it was time for action. I took the hammer and went out on the porch. Mother, mother. What is it? Minnie's gone crazy or something. What do you mean? What's she doing? Well, she's ripping her doctor sign off the door. Look. <sighs> Minnie, child, what are you doing? I refuse to be a practitioner without a practice. <laughs> That was a bitter summer. And suddenly I knew I had to get away. Far away, as far away as I could go. Paris. Paris. What next? The most famous professors of medicine in the world are in Paris. Mary, you're a good girl. 
And for a female, you're not unintelligent. Thank you, Father. But it's about time you understood one thing. It's not your lack of medical knowledge that's driving patients away. It's, uh, it's your lack of pants. Sure. Uh, I beg your pardon, Mother. I do indeed. To tell you the truth, I'm not much of a doctor, Father. Not much more than a nurse, really. After all, how much training have I had? Two years of chemistry, a year of medical school. But with a degree from the École de Médecine, ah, then you'd have a real doctor in the family. But I don't want a real doctor in the family. Above all, I don't want a female one. How would you live in Paris? You know your father's finances have touched bottom. But I have some savings. I could live on them. And I could tutor and write occasional pieces for the American papers, just as I wrote those articles down in New Orleans. Father could arrange that. Oh, yes, indeed. Father can arrange anything. I knew you would agree. Here, look. Oh, so that's where my yellow jar disappeared. I've been wondering. What's that? Here, hold out your hands. See, I have already changed my savings into gold Napoleon. <laughs> Mary Putnam, you have the will of a, of a... Yes, you may go to Paris, but heaven help the French. Two months after my arrival, I had already gained permission to enter the Lariboisière, a general hospital and the Salpetriere for nervous diseases and the insane. But as for the great iron gateway of the Ecole de Médecine... Oh, but no, mademoiselle, it is impossible. Why impossible? Why, why, why is simply because it is impossible. We Americans do not recognize that word. Yes, but then you Americans are a strange people, mademoiselle. You tell me you are already a doctor in your country. Perhaps so, but here... Here, I suppose you consider it indelicate for a woman to be a doctor. Oh, no, mademoiselle. An Englishman might perhaps say that uh, we Frenchmen consider that it is uh, dangerous. Dangerous? Monsieur, do I look dangerous? Yeah, in a class of young men, let us say, an anatomy class. Yes, very dangerous. <laughs> There it was again. No females wanted. I stood outside the école, knocking, knocking, knocking. But prejudice and tradition kept me out. Then one day, I had to see the secretary of the faculty for a card to attend the école pratique. I stood before him in his office. Oh, but yes, I have viewed Mademoiselle in many of the clinics, I believe. Gracious, it sounds as if I were being inspected. <laughs> it is possible. But, monsieur, last year I applied for permission merely to attend the lectures and I was refused. I know, I was the one who refused. But then... Uh... Since then, I have learned that the Minister of Public Instruction is much interested in the question of uh, women doctors. And since we must always look for an opportunity to please the minister... <laughs> But the secretary reckoned without the faculty, and the faculty said no. My moods ran gray and gloomy as the river. One day at the dinner table, my landlady said to me, Why, mademoiselle, you have scarcely touched the food. What is the trouble? Do you not like my pot of fruit? Oh, it's delicious, but I'm afraid I'm not hungry. No? Then you are in love, perhaps. I, I don't think so. If you can think, you are not in love. Perhaps it is because you have been refused admission to the medical school. Madame Artung, you are a shrewd woman. Oh, but why be depressed, Sherry? There are ways, you know. Ways? You tell me you are acquainted with Madame Garnier. Well, Madame Garnier is uh, acquainted with the minister. What could be simpler? You will excuse me, mademoiselle, but you are a woman, n'est-ce pas? Yes. Yes. I begin to see what you mean. There he is, Mary. Now remember, it is the woman who will get the doctor into the école. Ah, Monsieur le Ministre. Madame Garnier? I would like you to meet the young friend of whom I spoke, Mademoiselle Putnam from America. Mademoiselle, I am enchanted. Thank you, Monsieur le Ministre. Oh, what a sparkle here tonight. Oh, it is as if... Ah, there is René. I must speak with him. Excuse me? Certainly. Uh, Madame Garnier tells me that you are a physician. It does not seem possible. Shall I show you my diploma? <laughs> it would be useless, Mademoiselle. 
But uh, why are you so interested in getting into our occult uh, medicine? I have a degree, and just enough science to know that I know nothing. That is why I came to your country. There are no greater medical schools in the world than here in France. Oh, but uh, men and women in the same class, uh, isn't that something like touching flame to gunpowder? Oh, monsieur, my sole interest is science. And with such a gracious figure, what a pity. Oh, well, mademoiselle, perhaps something can be done. Do not lose heart. Shall we dance? You are listening to Madeline Carroll in Make Way for the Lady on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. Our play is about Mary Putnam Jacoby, one of America's first woman doctors. As it continues, Mary Putnam is about to realize her ambition to be admitted to the famous École de Médecine in Paris, where no woman has ever been admitted before. I tell you she will make a splendid physician. She has ability and she is not uh, unattractive. It will not help. Mark my words. The uproar of those students will be frightful. Ah, we shall see. I'm glad it's not my class, mon vieux. Uh, look, the professor takes his place. The class comes to attention. Hmm. She seems calm enough. Just wait. Monsieur, madame. What? No riots? No insults? It's all a bit disappointing. It is history. Place aux dames. Make way for the ladies. The first woman enters l'école de médecine. My first examination. I was nervous, worried. When the ordeal was over, I retired to the coat room to wait for the usher who would bring in the decision. When I got there... Mary! Jacques, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, be calm now, be calm. Uh, don't get excited. Uh, uh, here, here, sit down. Uh, uh, drink this water. I, I remember how nervous I was when well, I... Well, for heaven's sake, Jacques, you're more excited than I. Uh, just be calm, Mary. Uh, oh, here comes the usher. No, it's the professors themselves. Well, mademoiselle... Would you like me to tell you the grade you have received? If you would be so kind. We have decided on très satisfait. Very satisfactory. It is the highest mark. And so the years went by, and the time came for me to go home. I was sick as usual during that homeward voyage but my heart was bright as the spray that sparkled in our wake. I was a doctor. I was only 29 when I opened my office in the basement of our family home, and the following autumn I began to teach at the Women's Medical College. And then that great day came when the Medical Society of the County of New York admitted me to membership. I can still hear Dr. Abraham Jacoby the newly elected president, as he made his inaugural address. Paris has turned out a woman doctor who will, I hope, prove to be an ornament of this society, the profession of this city, and our common country. Let it not be forgotten in the history of this society that we have now opened our doors to worthy members of the medical profession male or female, white or colored, and thus granted reality to the gospel of American citizenship. Well, Dr. Jacoby, I don't think you've met the young lady you were just talking about. No, I have not had the pleasure. Uh, then allow me. Dr. Putnam, may I present Dr. Abraham Jacoby? Uh, don't let him frighten you. He is really quite human. <laughs> He was human, all right. I married Dr. Jacoby shortly after, and we were very happy. But as I looked around at the America of that day, lifting its people to higher and higher standards, freeing its slaves of color and its slaves of labor, yet I saw the millions of my own sex still unredeemed, 
And finally, at the New York State Constitutional Convention of 1890. Gentlemen, gentlemen, the convention will please come to order. Dr. Mary Jacoby. Gentlemen, it is with a deep sense of the momentous importance of our errand that we present ourselves before you this Women day. Women belong in the home, not in public life. Women are adequately represented by the male vote. What about the family? Gentlemen, please. We've heard enough of these absurd demands. Go back to your laboratory, doctor. Laboratory? Send her back to her kitchen. <laughs> you must and you will listen. Gentlemen, the moment has at last arrived when women may, with equal justice and decorum, come forward to claim a place among the other powers of the earth. This is no time to press such a demand. Other issues are too critical. Are you claiming that political rights may be demanded only when political life shall have ceased to exist? No, gentlemen. The time to press the demand is when Women's some... Women's suffrage has no place in democracy. Then you are saying that after a hundred years of trial... Democracy has proved such a failure that its principles must now be repudiated. How can democracy prove other than a failure when the citizens of a free state cease to believe in it? How can political affairs move among large issues if the only ideas which are abroad, which are respected, are fatally small? No, gentlemen, I refuse to believe that. For good or for ill... The question of the rights of women has been raised and will not down. <laughs> now, now, be quiet, children. Don't you see your grandmother sleeping? Hmm? Oh. Who's been sleeping? Mother. I've been writing a long letter. Why, Mother, you wrote only a few lines. Look, <laughs> the paper's fallen to the floor. I must have dozed off. What time is it? Uh, oh, I don't know. The clock seems to have stopped. Oh. Grandma, Grandma, tell us a story. A story, my dears? My story has been told. Thank you, Madeline Carroll. Before we tell you about next week's play, here's news from DuPont about chemicals that farmers and victory gardeners can put to work on the home front. For a time, it looked as if war plants would need most of the chemical that makes DuPont weed killer so highly effective, but growers will be able to get it this summer. DuPont weed killer has undergone extensive tests in actual commercial use that prove it is more effective in controlling poison ivy than any other chemical. One application usually does the job. This is of particular importance to orchardists, where ivy poisoning is often a serious hazard to workers. The weed killer is also effective against choke cherry, ragweed, the plant that torments hay fever victims, honeysuckle, and most of the ordinary weeds that are a nuisance and a threat to crops everywhere. DuPont weed killer leaves no residue dangerous to pets or livestock. Nor is there any danger of fire in using it. In fact, it's actually a fire retardant. It's clean and odorless, and it dissolves easily in water. It has no permanent sterilizing effect on the soil. After it's used, the ground may be worked later in the same season. And here's a note of caution. It must be borne in mind that DuPont weed killer kills weeds and valuable plants alike. So care should be used in spraying it. Another major threat to the farmer and gardener is insects. They destroy 10% of the carrot crop, 12% of the bean crop, 15% of our potatoes. With insects, too, DuPont farm chemicals can help you. DuPont lime sulfur, Bordeaux mixture, and lead arsenate are old favorites that have fought insect pests for years. Dutox insecticide is a preparation especially good in combating the Mexican bean beetle. Calcium arsenate protects cotton, potatoes, and other hardy plants. DuPont Copper A compound is formulated for plants that are sensitive to Bordeaux mixture. Sulfuron for fungus diseases of plants is a sulfur of extremely fine particle size. 
We can't give you a complete list here, but we will be glad to send, if you will write to the radio section, DuPont Company, Wilmington, Delaware, a free copy of DuPont's spraying and dusting schedule and free folders on DuPont weed killer and poison ivy. These products are available through many dealers who supply such materials in every community. Inquire soon in order to protect your plantings. Weed killer and insecticides are effective, helpful examples of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. And now here is the star of this evening's cavalcade, Madeline Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Today is Flag Day. This Flag Day of 1943 has a deeper, richer significance to all of us. Our flag flies on every sea, every continent, winning new glories, bringing to oppressed people everywhere the American conception of freedom. This year, too, one more closed door has been opened to women. Women, for the first time, are privileged to wear the uniform of the armed forces. So it seems appropriate for the Cavalcade of America to present the first woman physician to be commissioned in the Medical Corps of the United States Army, Major Margaret D. Craighill, speaking from Washington. I could not help feeling, as I listened to Cavalcade's story tonight, that if Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby were alive, she would have been in the forefront of the women physicians who have been pleading for permission to serve in the Medical Corps of the United States Army. And if she were alive, she might very properly be here in my uniform tonight. Mary Putnam would have relished and gloried in the sight of women in uniform serving in the armed forces and working in defense plants. For by defying nothing but convention and prejudice, she did so much to bring these things about. For the first time in history, there is a great opportunity for women physicians in the United States Army Medical Corps. Many more physicians are needed for the tremendous task of caring for our wounded and restoring them to help. I can tell you from personal experience that an injured man does not care whether the hands that try to help him are those of a man or of a woman, as long as they are skillful. Women doctors must perform their share of the necessary medical services required by our Army. Women physicians who write to the Surgeon General of the Army in Washington will be given immediate consideration and a cordial reception, as I know from first-hand experience. This invitation comes from the men and women now serving with the Army and is a challenge many American women physicians will gladly accept. Next week, the Cavalcade of America will dramatize the story of a gallant ship wounded in battle, her rudder shot away, and valiantly making her way 10,000 miles through sub-infested waters to her home port. The new glory won by this grand old ship has earned for her the title, The Unsinkable Marblehead. Next week, with Dean Jagger as our star, DuPont will tell this exciting story in an original play by Charles K. Freeman. Be with us next week when DuPont presents Dean Jagger as its star in The Unsinkable Marblehead, an epic story of naval heroism on the Cavalcade of America. The orchestra and musical score tonight were under the direction of Donald Vorey. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor... The DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. I'm a professional painter. I like the new DuPont Speed Easy wall finish. It saves time on every job. It thins with water and dries in an hour. With water and dries in an hour. I'm a housewife. I like DuPont Speed Easy, too. I painted right over our living room wallpaper. It looks wonderful. Cost less than $3. It's quite...